ACCA Advanced Financial Management exam, heavily examines the free cash flow either in the investment appraisal, which means you've got a new project to invest in, alternatively requiring you to value a business. And this is why we need to firstly understand what do I mean by free cash flows. Free cash flows would just to be the cash flows left within the business because cash flows left within the business, we need to repay this back to either debt holders, which means who lends us money before in the form of interests and the principles that we need to pay to them. Alternatively, the shareholders, which means we know the fund providers can either come from debt or equity. So money left within the business, we need to repay this back to either debt holders and the shareholders. So therefore, if I can work out how much money left that can be distributed to both debt and equity holders, this means the free cash flows to firm. Alternatively, if we can work this out that by taking the money left within the business that can be distributed to both debt and equity holders, and after we're subtracting any interest and principles to the debt holders, the money left within the business will be the free cash flows to equity, which means the money that we can distribute solely to the shareholders. Now, to work out the free cash flow, firstly, we need to work out the free cash flows to firm, and then subtracting any interests and the principal that we pay, or the redemption value, if you like, that we pay to the debt holders we can arrive at the final free cash flows to equity. To calculate the free cash flows to firm, you will need to take the profit before interest and tax. And sometimes it's also known as operating profit or the earnings before interest and tax here. This can be calculated, for example, if you were to invest in a project, you may be estimating the future revenue and the future costs and you can arrive at the profit before interest and tax. Alternatively, you can get this figure from the published financial statement of a given company. Uh, so you can work out uh, how much will be the profit before interest and tax there. Uh, usually, this will be disclosed by the entity directly. Because to calculate the money left within the business, we need to pay tax to a tax authority. So that's the very first step we need to calculate that $700, which means by timing by 1 minus 30% tax rates that we assume, if the PBIT being 1,000, that 700 approximate to the profit after tax, which means the money left within the business in the end. And I will tell you why in a second, why we are not subtracting interest at this particular stage. Because we need to work out the free cash flows to firm to both debt and equity holders. And of course, the second step that we need to do is to convert the accounting profit into cash profit. To calculate the accounting profit before of $700 there, we have already subtracted any non-cash expenses such as depreciation. So therefore, we need to plus any non-cash expenses back, which means plusing depreciation expenses back worth of 30 that we assume here because we invest in the project that may result in the cash outflow that we need to buy inventories or allowing credit to our customers. So therefore, we need to subtract $120 there, reflecting the fact that this will be the investment in working capital. Alternatively, we owe money to a supplier. Yes, we save money worth of $40 there. We need to plus that back. So, also, we need to consider any investment activities related to investment in capital expenditures. So, for example, if you were to invest in a future project, you will need to buy, for example, land, buildings, plants and machineries. So, if that's the case, assuming that we need to spend $35 out, so we simply take 700 plus 50 minus 80 and then minus 35. That leaves us the free cash flows to firm that can be distributed to both debt and equity holders worth of $635 there. And from that 635 
we need to subtract in the interest and redemption value. So here, I only include the interest element, let's say $80 worth of interest. However, when we are subtracting this, we cannot simply subtract the full of $80 of the interest expense. We need to subtract the net amount, which means the interest net of tax. The reason behind it is because of this. Because firstly, we start with the profit before interest and tax. And to calculate the tax expense that we need to pay to the tax authority, we need to arrive at the profit before tax by deducting interest from the PBIT. So from the profit before tax or PBT, we then times by 30% of the tax rate. So this can work out how much tax that we need to pay to the tax authority. And because at the very first start, we have already subtracting any 30% of tax rate already. So this means that we have already calculated $700 before, which means using 1,000 times by 1 minus 30% of tax rate. And therefore, to calculate that profit after tax of 644, we need to use 920 times by 70% now. So it can give us the profit after tax. However, in terms of interest, we cannot simply subtract the full of 80 from the 700 now. Because from a mathematical point of view, we have already deducted 30% of taxes before, and then we need to calculate the profit after tax of 644, and then adding back any depreciation, and accounting for the investment in working capital and capital expenditures, later wants to arrive at the free cash flows to equity, what we have to do is also applying the same approach to the interest here from a mathematical point of view. And this is why we're only subtracting 56 there, because we only subtract the 80 times by 1 minus 30% of tax rate. So therefore, we have got 644 as the profit after tax, and we adjust for any depreciation of 50 minus 80 minus 35, this will also give me the free cash flows for equity worth of 579. So just to recap, you have to remember that is that when you calculate the free cash flows to the firm, in order to arrive at the free cash flows to equity, you minus interest times by 1 minus 30% or whatever tax rates that the examiner requires you to calculate. Another Examinable area in the exam is that the examiner will be very interested to see the ability is that the company using the free cash flows to pay off the dividend to the shareholders. So to compute the dividend cover, which means the ability that company can pay off its dividend, we simply take the free cash flows to equity, divide this into the dividend paid, let's say $50 here. So this means that we have got 11.58 times that we have got enough free cash flows to equity to pay off the dividend payment. Some of you may raise a question, well, Steve, when I compute the dividend cover in previous papers, we simply use the earnings per share, divide this into the dividend per share. Yes, you're right, but that's more from the financial accounting's point of view, but here from the financial management's point of view, we need to use in the numerator the free cash flows to equity. So make sure that you are ready for that. And of course, sometimes the examiner in this paper is keen to use the name dividend capacity to stand for the free cash flow to equity. So make sure that you're aware of a terminology like that. The second area in the syllabus is to require you to value a business. So we can use the free cash flows to firm simply discount at the weighted average cost of capital because the WAC will account for the payment to both debt and equity holders in the form of cost of debt and cost of equity. We mix them both all together. And then what we need to do is to value a business, effectively we are valuing its equity. So after we discount the free cash flows to firm over the WAC, and then we need to subtract any value of debt to calculate the value of equity, in other words. Alternatively, if you start with the free cash flows to equity as a numerator, 
you need to use the cost of equity as a denominator, which means discount at cost of equity, solely reflecting the payment to shareholders to arrive at the value of equity or the value of a business, if you like. The idea behind it is because when we are valuing a business using the free cash flow methodology, actually we are using the perpetuity approach. So this means that we assume the cash flows will be forever. And this means that in order to calculate the present value, which means the value of business right now, we need to take the future cash flows or the future value, if you like, in the numerator, can either be to firm or free cash flows to equity times by the perpetuity factor, which means one divided into the discount rate. If I'm going to be using to firm the discount rate, I'm going to be using WAC. If I'm using to equity as a numerator, the discount rate, I need to use the cost of equity. And this exam, to calculate the cost of equity, we can use the dividend valuation model, we can use the CAPM formula, we can also use the m and proposition number two. These three formulae have been given by the examiner in the AFM. Okay then, now let's see a case. If I'm going to give you the WAC being 10%, because previously we just calculated the free cash flows to firm worth of 635. We simply use that 635 divided into 10% of the WAC and to minus the value of debt being 1495. And this will leave me the value of the business being 48.25. Alternatively, if you start with the free cash flows to equity being 579 that we just calculated, we simply divide this into the cost of equity being 12%. Again, it gives me the value of a business being $48.25 there. So make sure that you're aware that free cash flow will be tested in this way. Happy studying and congratulations, you've passed the topic free cash flows already in the ACCA Advanced Financial Management paper. ABC, accounting for your future.